it. So just a couple things as we before we get started. Uh, so you're going to have some opportunities to ask questions today. You can type those questions into the Q&A box. Um, and remember that box is just for questions. So that's where you can ask questions to our farmer uh, or to our, our fiber mill owner. You can put those there. Anytime you have a question, feel free to add to the Q&A box. If you chat, others are not going to be able to see it. Only myself as the host is, are going to be able to see your question or your um, notes in the chat box. So we won't be able to chat with your friends or with your teachers during this time if you're connecting remotely. A couple other notes. Right now, you can see my screen and you can see this is a map of New York State. Hopefully, you know just about where you live on this map, maybe what county you're in. But you can see two big stars. We're going to two different places today on our virtual field trip. So we're starting at the one star in Genesee County uh, with our farmer, and then we'll be traveling way across the state to Washington County, which is right on the Vermont border. So we're going to be starting in Genesee and then moving our fiber, our wool, all the way over to Washington County across the state, and you'll get that experience today. So thank you all so much for being here. We're so excited. It looks like we're getting a lot of our attendees, our classrooms signed on. Um, hopefully you can hear us okay. Um, and we are just so excited to, uh, to talk with you all today. Remember, this is a Zoom webinar, so your microphones aren't on and nor are your cameras. You're just going to be listening and watching um, our, our uh, virtual field trip today. So as you can see, I'm going to uh, spotlight my friend, Emmeline. She is the owner and shepherd of uh, Orchard View Lincoln Long Wolves. And Emmeline has had sheep for a long time and we are so excited to visit her farm today. So Emmeline, would you mind telling us about why you decided to raise sheep? How did that all get started for you? Absolutely. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Orchard View Farm in Virgin, Genesee County, as Katie showed you on the map. Uh, my name is Emma, and I have been raising Lincoln Longwell sheep since I was 12 years old. I have loved sheep since the day I was born. I always tell people that I never have had a different favorite animal. And it took me until I was 12 years old um, to convince my parents to let me get sheep. And now here I am years later, and I now have a flock of over 60 sheep. I raise what's called the Lincoln long wool breed. And just like it says in their name, long wool, they grow very, very long lustrous wool and are mostly used for their wool production. Sheep can be used for either meat, milk, or wool. And my sheep are primarily used for um, wool, but I also do sell quite a bit for their meat. As you can see, they come in two different colors. They come in white, and um, black, which we call natural color. And this can be range anything from a light silver, like you'll see in some of my other sheep, to a very, very dark black, like this mama right here. The Lincoln Longwell breed is really unique because it was, it's a, what's called a heritage breed. It's a very, very old breed that originated in England in Europe and came here over 200 years ago and there are very very few of them here in the U.S. so that makes my flock kind of unique. So what we're going to do first today is I'm going to talk about how we feed our animals and keep them healthy. Then we're going to talk about something really exciting that happens in the spring, lambing, and then we're going to talk a little bit about their wool since that's so important to my breed and to sheep in general. So first, let's talk about what we feed my sheep. Sheep are what's called a ruminant, which means they have four different compartments to their stomach, which is very integral to how we feed them. The most important part is that they get forage, which this time of year, because it's snowing on April 22nd, 21st, whatever it is, 22nd, um, we feed them hay. And we make this in the summertime and it's fed to the sheep all winter long um, when they don't have good access to pasture. Pretty soon we will um, put them out on pasture when there's green grass and that's where they'll spend the summer, filling their bellies with really nice grass. 
Now this time of year, because we don't have a lot of grass, we also supplement our sheep with grain. This is a really sweet feed that has pellets and corn in it, as you can see. And we give this to our sheep for extra energy. It keeps them warm in the winter. It helps them grow their lambs in their bellies. And also this time of year, produce milk for their lambs. Um, and just like you guys might take your vitamins and minerals in the morning through like your Flintstone gummies or whatever it is, we also give our sheep access to vitamins and minerals and they can eat as much of this as they want. All right, so might get a little bit loud, but we're gonna go over to the other part of the barn and feed the sheep. And you'll see just how excited they get over their grain. So Emma, while we're moving over to this part, Noah from Radis Elementary wants to know, how old are you? If you don't mind sharing. I am. <laughs> I don't mind sharing. I am 30 years old. So I've been raising sheep for most of my life. <laughs> so these are some of my older girls that have um, already lambed, as well as my yearlings who are only one year old. So they don't have lambs yet. And you can see um, some of them have been sheared. We'll talk about shearing in a few minutes. Um, and some of them haven't. And my younger sheep, the ones that are only a year old, like these two girls here, um, have not been shorn because they're a little bit younger. And you can see this one back here is very silver. And this one right here is very black. We, both, we call both of those natural colored. Um, so I feed my sheep grain um, this time of year, one time a day. <laughs> This is not their normal time of day. We normally feed in the evening and give them a nice big dinner before nighttime. Um, so they're probably pretty excited right now that they get, they get a midday snack or maybe a, maybe a lunchtime. Um, they're spending most of their day today inside because it's cold out, but um, they do have access to the pasture. They'll eat no matter what, even if it's cold, um, but not when there's snow on the ground. And then we give them their hay in those racks back there and they get fresh hay every day. And um, up here, we have a very, very old barn that's over 100 years old. And up top is where we store the hay in our hay mow. So that's where we put it all summer long. And then we're able to feed it during the winter time. Um, so the Emma, other important, we, oh, yes. Sorry, Emma, we do have another question. So yeah. one of this, Allie wants to know, so are the black and the white sheep, are they different breeds or are they the same type of sheep, but just their, their wool is a different color? That's a really great question. They are the same breed of sheep. They are all Lincoln Longwools, but just like some of you guys may have maybe a Labrador Retriever at home, you black labs can come in like black or they can come in brown or different colors. The same thing with um, my breed of sheep. They're the same breed, but they just come in different colors. That's a great question. So the other part, important part of my chores during the day is making sure that my animals have clean water. This is where we get our water and I fill up the pails, dump it into the water buckets behind here. It's very cold today, so we've got them plugged in so they don't freeze. Um, but water is really important to any living animal. Um, so we make sure they have clean water every day. So I mentioned that spring is a really exciting time of year and that's because it's when we lamb. Um, so our sheep are bred in the fall and then in the spring, um, we actually lamb January to about March, um, they have their babies. And this year we had about 35 lambs. Um, unfortunately, we finished a few weeks ago so they aren't teeny tiny right now. Um, but when they're born, we put them in what's called a jug, which is a very small pen about the size of this pen back here, um, where the lamb can bond with the mother. That's very important with sheep. And they lamb um, at all times of the day, even in the middle of the night. So we have cameras that we're able to see uh, what's happening all night long. And we have some cameras in here so we can watch the mamas and the babies. And we also have a camera out in the big part of the barn that I, we were just in um, so that we can see if anybody's lambing in the middle of the night and know if we need to come out. 
So Emma, that yes. is okay. that is just like a baby monitor, right? If a mom was yes. watching their baby, you're watching for your babies all night. And does that come right to your phone or do you have something on your computer for to watch what's happening in the barn? It's exactly like a baby monitor, but it's like a lamb monitor. <laughs> um, and it comes right to my phone. So I don't even have to get out of bed. I can just wake up at two in the morning and see what's happening. Very um, neat. So yeah, so after the lambs um, have bonded with their mother and the, when they're a couple days old, we put them into a bigger pen. And you guys have probably seen the little lambs in here. You can see the other udders on the ewes, which is what we call a, the moms. The girl sheep are called ewes. Um, and they uh, begin to bond with the rest of the flock. Sheep are a flock animal, which means they really prefer to be with their own kind over um, other animals. It's really important that um, you don't ever have just one sheep. You need to have multiples because of their flocking instincts. And we give the lambs um, room to, to be by themselves and to, to play and to have their own grain. I mentioned that we feed the moms only one time a day, but the babies, because they're growing really quickly, need to have access to um, their food all day long. So we put them in this pen here, which is called a creep. And you can see there's um, slats over to the left, which is um, where the lambs can get through, but the mamas can't fit. And they have access to their own grain all day long. So Margaret wants to know, um, why do the mamas only eat once a day? That's a great question, Margaret. It depends on the flock and how much you're feeding. I have just found that for my flock, giving them their grain one time a day is enough. But um, Sheep actually eat all day long and they can eat their hay and they can go out on pasture and they will be eating all day long. So it's just this extra nutrition, this extra grain that we give them only one time a day. But they actually are, um, when it's not snowing outside, they'll be out on pasture eating grass all day long. That's a great question. So the other important thing that we have to do is keep them on clean, um, keep their pens really, really clean. And here we showed the hay earlier, but next to it, we have a bale of straw. And we use this to um, bed the pens down, to keep them warm, to keep them clean. Um, so straw is also a really important part of my chores and making sure that my animals stay healthy. Um, so feel free to ask questions about lambing. I'm sure I, I miss something we, but no, in the we, meantime oh we have lots of we have we do with you <laughs> so um if we okay. have some friends in Washington County Greenwich Elementary and they want to know how many lambs does a sheep have do they ever have multiples that's a really great great question um most of the time my sheep actually have twins so I don't know if you guys have any twins in your classroom there probably aren't very many but my sheep most of the time have twins we sometimes have one and we sometimes have triplets but twins is the most common and that's a great question and because you're having so many and um, you've been raising sheep for so long, um, Mrs. Zelkowitz's class in Niskayuna wants to know, do you name your sheep or do you name the babies? I sometimes do. They often get nicknames, um, but I do have some. There's a you over here that I've named Laura after one of my friends. Um, I also have some over in the bigger part of the barn named Petra. I have one named B, like a bumblebee, um, but I, they all get ear tags. You can see they have uh, a white one and then some of them have a white and a blue one. The lambs, you can maybe see it a little bit better like on this one here. Um, they, and these lamp, they all get a unique number. So see this one is 1374. Um, and that's how I tell them apart mostly is by their number. So that's kind of like their name. And I know them all, even if they don't have a, a personal name, like you or I have a personal name, they all have a number and I, tend, I can tell them apart because they all have um, different personalities. Some of them are much more um, skittish. Some are very friendly. Some are bossy. I have one over there named um, Beatrice that we call bossy Beatrice um, because she's, she's kind of the boss of the flock. Um, so they all do have different personalities. And even if they don't have a name, um, I, I can tell them all apart. So I think we probably only have a few minutes left. So let's talk about the very important part of sheep, which is their wool production. 
So you can, you can probably tell, and we talked a little bit about how some of the sheep are already sheared and some are not. Um, we actually just sheared on Sunday, three days ago. Um, so they've got a, a fresh buzz cut. Unfortunately, we couldn't demo that for you today, but I hope you guys had the opportunity to watch the video ahead of time and see how that's done. But because uh, my sheep are a wool breed, remember the Lincoln long wool, I actually shear them two times a year because their wool grows so fast. Um, so we just had our spring shearing and then we'll shear again in the fall. The tool that we use is a pair of hand clippers that look like this. So if any of you boys out there ever buzz cut your hair, it's just like that, only a lot bigger. Um, and this tool, um, nicely, gently is able to take the wool right off the animal without hurting them at all. And it goes by pretty quick. It takes less than five minutes to do a whole animal. Um, I don't actually do that myself. I have some friends that come and do it. That's their full-time job is they are full-time shearers and they travel all over the country shearing flocks of sheep. So they're, they're professionals and they're really good. At the same time, um, we may trim up some of the ones that aren't getting sheared with these hand shears. Um, and these can be used to trim up, you know, mucky areas or if they have a burdock or something that needs to be cut out, we can use these. And at the same time, we have to trim their hooves. <clears throat> Just like your fingernails grow, my sheep's hooves grow. And so we have these clippers that um, we use to cut their hooves and keep their hooves nice and healthy. So once we shear the sheep, we get um, a fleece fleece is what we call the wool after it comes off the animal that looks like this. Um, it can weigh anywhere from five to over 10 pounds, depending on the age of the animal and how long it's been since our last shearing. Um, our spring shearing is not the best quality. The best quality comes in the fall. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. In the winter time, when it's cold, the animals are spending more of their energy to keep themselves warm, to grow their lambs and then feed their lambs. So the wool doesn't grow quite as long. But in the fall um, is when their wool is absolutely beautiful and a lot, a lot denser. Um, but this is what we'll take. Um, I'll do what's called skirting. Um, so I'll pull out some of the pieces like this little piece of straw here. We'll just pull that out, discard it, um, and then it can be processed, um, which is what you guys will see next. Um, so I have my wool made into roving and yarn, um, which Mary Jean will talk about. And actually she made the yarn that, um, I made this hat out of. So this hat that I'm wearing is actually made out of yarn that Mary Jean made out of wool from my sheep. So Katie, are there any final questions before we package this up and send it to Mary Jean? We do. I think we have time for two or three questions um, from okay. our students and there's a lot of great ones on here. So they <laughs> want to know you're shearing them um, right before winter time when you do your fall shearing and then, you know, if we still have some snow on the ground. We have some snow on the ground today. So are it's your lambs here. <laughs> cold? Are, are they cold no. after you shear them? <laughs> No, they're definitely not cold. And I do get that question a lot. Um, you know, it's it's cold here today, just like it probably is at all of your places. And it's snowing outside and they don't look very cold to me. Um, they they uh, huddle together when it does get cold and they're really good at staying out of the wind. Um, so they always have access to the barn. And when it gets very, very cold, we'll shut these big barn doors. Um, but sheep actually have a much higher body temperature than we do. Our body temperature is around 97 or 98. A sheep's body temperature is 103. So they're already um, warmer than we are. Um, and they do, we don't shear it straight down to the skin. There still is a little bit of um, wool on there that keeps them warm and their body knows that it's cold. And so they'll start producing wool right away. And it's not, it's only a few days before growth starts coming back. But that's a great question. And I get that one a lot. <laughs> so here's a question from Mrs. Kinkler's class at Byron Virgin. We saw the video of the shearing and wondered how do the how do you keep the sheep so calm while they're being sheared? Well, first of all, shout out to Byron Virgin because that's where I went to school. So I'm glad there's people joining um, from locally. Um, so sheep have a lot of different pressure points, and you probably noticed on the 
video that the first thing the shearer does is actually shit, sit the sheep down on their butt. And when they do that, they become um, very mellow because they're not used to being in that position. And they, um, it, it just naturally keeps them calm. And then there's different pressure points along the sheep's body that a shearer knows by heart to push on to kind of keep them calm through the whole process. So a skilled shearer is very, very gentle in the way that they're moving the sheep in the way um, that they shear. And they all follow a very similar pattern as they're shearing. Um, and it's, it's just a pattern that throughout history we know works, keeps them calm. And like I said, there are different pressure points that they're able to use, um, but it's it's not a scary process for them at all. Oh, wonderful. I think we have um, just one more question, but before we get to that last question, just reiterate, it, it it does not hurt the sheep at all when they get shorn. Do they, do they like to be sheared? What does that feel like for them? Um, so like I said earlier, if any of you guys have ever gotten like boys in your classroom have ever gotten a buzz cut, it feels just like that. The shears vibrate a little bit, but they move right across the skin um, and take take the hair right off the top of the skin. They don't actually touch the skin. There's still wool there um, that you can see just a little bit, but there's still wool there. Um, and so they don't they don't really feel anything at all. It's hard to know whether they like it. They probably don't like it because it's a position that they're not used to being in, but the whole process lasts less than five minutes. Um, they don't ever get cut and uh, we put them back in with their friends and they're happy as can be. Don't even know what happened. <laughs> so our final question from Mrs. Stoll's class, how many sheep would need to be sheared to make a coat or a sweater? That's a great question. So I mentioned that my fleece, and we'll go back over here because we still have to package this up. Um, my fleece weighs about um, five, let's say five pounds. And um, sheep have a, an oil in their wool called lanolin. If you were to feel this, and maybe you guys have um, the roving in your classrooms, you may be able to still feel the little bit of oiliness and that's called lanolin. And when you wash this fleece, it may lose almost half of its weight. So a five pound fleece may only end up with about three pounds by the time it's washed. And then there's some losses during the spinning process that maybe Mary Jean can talk about a little bit more. Um, but I would say if your sweater, so my hat could be made with one, one fleece about this size, but a sweater, you may need maybe two, two to three sheep's worth, depending on the type of sweater. So it does take a lot and there are a little bit of losses along the way. Um, but it's a fun process. <laughs> well, Emma, and, we can't we can't say thank you enough for inviting us into your barn today. So you're going to package that fleece up and we're all going to wave goodbye to you. And we are going to watch you package that up and we are going to zoom across the state. Um, we are going to go ahead and move from Genesee County and we are going to um, go over to Washington County to Greenwich, New York. And we are going to go meet our friend uh, Mary Jean Packer. So let's get Mary Jean up here. Hi Mary Jean, we are so glad to see you today. Um, we are so happy to be here at uh, Bat and Kill Fibers. Can you tell us a little bit about your job? Hi Katie, hi everyone. It's great to have you here and we're just going to give you a quick tour through the mill and talk about how yarn is made once we get the fleeces here. And before I do that, though, I want to give a big shout out to our friends at the Greenwich schools. I heard that you all were on. So hi, everyone in Greenwich. We're here in Washington County. So there may be other schools from other parts of Washington County here with us today, too. And we're so glad to have you. If you want to come and see this in person, you guys, you can this weekend. And this Saturday and this Sunday from 10 to 4 each day is Washington County Fiber Tour. And you can get more information about it online at WashingtonCountyFiberTour.org. So let's get started here on what we've got. Um, here's, here's the fleece that Emma put. You just saw her shear it. She had put it in the box and sent us the box. And now we're going to unpack the fleece. Um, so here we go. We should have Emma's fleece in here. 
There's her bag. And Mary Jean, is this how most of your fleece arrives in the mail or do people drop it off? Um, now we have more and more fleece that comes in the, in the mail, but people are welcome to drop it off. Um, Jeremiah is showing folks a picture of some of the wool that has come this week. So you see there's three boxes that came in the mail and then quite a few bags or even bigger containers like totes. Usually Emma comes here in person and brings a truckload of wool, but she just sent this one box today so that I could show you all what happens after her wool gets here and talk about some of the characteristics of her wool. So this is her nice white wool that she just took off her sheep the other day. And so here's what we look for. She said she skirted it and she does a beautiful job, but every now and then there's still a couple of little pieces of hay in it. So we just drop it here on the table to make sure that there's not any extra vegetation. Our machines will do a pretty good job of getting that out, but still we wanna make sure it's as clean as it possibly can be. So see, I'm just shaking it now, get out any little pieces or any pieces of vegetation and it's very clean. So our next step is gonna be washing this. You all heard that Emmeline said about all the lanolin. And so this fleece right here probably weighs about five pounds. And after we wash it, um, that lanolin will come out in the wash and this will only weigh about four pounds after that very first step. Because even though this is quite white and quite pretty, there'll still be some lanolin come out and dirt. So let me just show you a couple of characteristics of fleece before we wash it. And so these zigzags here, this is a real close up of the fleece and that's beautiful crimp. You saw how curly Emma's sheep were. And so that's what we're after is this nice, long, strong, look at how strong and shiny this is. It's a beautiful fleece, Emma, thank you for that. Um, not all fiber comes in here looking so lovely. But what we're gonna do with Emma's fleece now is we're gonna put it in this machine right behind me called an opener. And what this machine is gonna do is get this fiber ready to be washed. We have to, you saw how I was pulling it a little when I was getting it ready uh, to show you. Well, this machine's gonna pull all the ends apart for us and get it ready so we can wash it. So I'm gonna turn this on, it's super loud, um, but I think you all don't really hear the noise as much. So we're really safe here in a factory. So this is a, a kill switch of this machine had anything stuck in it, we could immediately turn it off. And this is just the regular turn it on. And now it's gonna go in there. And Mary Jean, this all happens before this wool is even washed. This is the stuff that has to happen before you start washing or dyeing or anything. And there it comes. So that's ready to be washed now. Um, Jeremiah, let's show them. Oh, good. Show them how much more open that is. So it's a lot more uh, ready to be cleaned. It goes over there into those sinks in these baskets. We'll pack that right into this basket. This basket drops with that hoist right into the sink. And that's how it gets clean. So come Mary with Jean, me, I'll show you what's next. What Mary Katie? Jean, we, we do have a question. So uh, are you only dealing with one farm's wool at a time or do you mix the wool from different farms? It depends, that's a really good question. 
see how the wool on these racks have people's names on it, like that one says Stiffle, who's a farm in Maryland, and Diane, who owns a farm in Kentucky, and Emma's wool, it will be by itself. But that's our own fiber here that says fat and kill fibers gray. So this is a mix from farms all over Washington County. But Diane's wool, Stiffel's wool, those are just their farm. So about half our business is custom processing. So for farmers just like Emma, who get their own fiber back, and about half our business is for yarn companies. And yarn companies don't own sheep. They are just businesses that, that want fiber. And so we buy a lot of wool from local farms. So this is the next step. After that fiber has been carded, then it comes over here and it gets ready to be spun. And remind us, Mary Jean, um, the carding process is getting all the fibers to go the same way, the same direction, right? Because they were kind That's of mishmash right. after they're washed. That's exactly right, Katie. Maybe we can show a quick shot of the carder on our way to the spinner. I know we're very short on time, and I'm sure that people have a lot of questions about these steps. And I want to make sure we can show them how yarn is fun and what we make with yarn. So we're going to move on to the spinning room. But before we go, Jeremiah, could you just show what Tim is working on way over there? That's the carter, Katie. And see those fibers are coming out. They're brown today, so it's a little hard to see. That's a really big machine. Yes. So let's go to spinning before we run out of time. While we're walking over there, uh, how far does the wool come to your to your mill? Uh, you mentioned Maryland and Kentucky. How far away does your wool travel? About the furthest away our wool comes is from New Mexico. We buy quite a lot of fine wool from there to blend with local wool and sometimes to run by itself, especially yarn that we're making for yarn companies. So you all saw that fiber that Emma um, had sent and then that we washed and carded. And now here it is the different color, but it's the same idea as what you all saw the pin drafter doing. This material is getting ready to get fed up and over and down into our spinner. And where when it comes through, it will come out looking like spun yarn. I know we only have a few minutes left. We could start taking questions while I'm walking, Katie. So while we're heading over to see how that fiber is then turned into yarn, Asher wants to know, does wool feel scratchy when you're touching it all day? Does wool feel scratchy? No, it feels greasy, Asher. Um, wool is actually very soft and it's the lanolin in it that we feel when we touch it all day. So this is the spinner where the yarn gets spun as a single ply and it gets put up onto bobbins like this. So these are the single ply yarn right here. And then this machine is twisting the three strands to make this. So this machine's work is to make three ply yarn and that's ready to go to weavers to make fabric or blankets, ready to go to knitters, people at home who knit, or machines that are used to knit things. And so here's how we take it from those bobbins and get it ready to go to knitters. So this is the same yarn that we put on the plier and twisted to make a three ply. And now Karen is winding it to make skeins. And the skeins are gonna look like this when they're done. So here's a finished skein, like we'll go to a yarn store.
and then we'll show you some of the finished products. I know we only have three or four minutes left, but I'm going as fast as I can. No, you're doing a great job, Barry Jean. So can you just explain the, um, the more, if you add more plies or more strings to your yarn, does that make it stronger? Yes, um, plied yarn is definitely stronger than single ply, especially if we're going to make machine knit items like these socks or these gloves. Um, you want these to be very rugged. And so using plied yarn here, is a very good idea. Here's some of the other things that these are all machine knit, just like this hat. And then some of you may be knitters yourself or your parents or grandparents might knit. So you're used to seeing yarn that looks like this. It's in a skein or you're used to seeing a hand knit sweater like this. Yarn is also used to make woven things. And here's a beautiful blanket that we made for a farm down in the Hudson Valley. Um, we've made blankets for Emma before from her pretty white and gray wool. And here's another multicolor. And um, this also has some alpaca fiber in it. Here in Washington County, we have almost as many alpacas as we do sheep. And alpacas are very popular also. That's How about one of our main no, that's one of our main questions is can you have fiber from other animals than sheep? We saw Emma's beautiful sheep, but other animals produce fiber as well. Is that right? Oh yes, Katie. Um, we have alpacas, uh, llamas, goats that make mohair, goats that make cashmere, um, bunny fiber called angora. And now here in Washington County, we have linen fiber and also hemp fiber. So we're seeing a lot of natural yarn or wool colors today, but uh, Ms. Maroney's class wants to know, do you dye it into different colors? Could you have a blue or a pink or a purple? Oh, very good question, Mrs. Maroney's class. Do you remember seeing the picture of the sweater that I held up? Um, that has two colors of blue in it. It has a light blue in it and a navy blue and also a little spot of orange. So we can take a skein like this, like this gray skein, natural gray skein, and put it in our dye pots and make it into gray or blue, um, um, orange, any color that um, people want. So yes, we dye it right, right here. So also talking about dyes, um, Mrs. Wong's class at Avenues wants to know, um, is the dye that you use safe and sustainable for the environment? Oh, isn't that a good question? Thank you so much for asking. Um, yes, we only use a dye that is, is very safe. Um, in fact, in our dyeing process, we make sure that every bit of the color is absorbed before we discard the water. And we only need to use a little bit of water because we use modern chemicals now um, to do that. So we're, they're um, very natural and very clean. The chemical, the strongest chemical is kind of like vinegar. It's called citric acid. So Edward from Radis Elementary wants to know, how long does it the whole process take from the time Emma's yarn or raw fleece arrives in the mail to the time that you're sending her um, her her finished blanket or yarn? How long does that process take? How long is her her wool at your facility? That's a really good question. If we didn't have any other wool here to work on besides Emma's we could probably go all the way from washing it to having it in skeins of yarn like this in about a week. And then we would need extra time to have it dyed or to send it out. We don't, you, we don't knit things like this here and we don't weave here. We work with other factories like ours that do nothing but knitting or weaving. And so if they had nothing else to do, they could make these in a couple of days at their factory too. But we get way backed up because we have so many farms like Emma who all want things done. 
and also so many yarn companies who all want things made for them. We have a great question, I think. Um, somebody wants to know, with, we think about agriculture and we think about food products going, they're perishable. Um, somebody wants to know, can your wool go bad? Uh, is it, how, how long can you keep it? Gosh, these are great questions, you guys. Thank you so much. Yes, um, wool can definitely go bad. You know, we've talked a lot about the lanolin that's in the wool. After three or four years, that lanolin kind of chemically changes and becomes more like a wax and less like a grease. So if you think about your crayon, and it's a wax crayon, and compare that to oil like you might cook with or put on your salad, it's pretty easy to clean up oil like you put on your salad, but a crayon that's stuck to stuff is just about impossible to get out. So once it once the lanolin changes state, it's pretty hard to work with. And also, not all farmers are as good as Emma at cleaning their wool before they send it here to the mill. And so if they leave too much dirt in there or manure, that's going to start spreading to the whole bag of fiber and could make it mildew. And then sometimes moths get in. So if the farmer isn't taking good care of their fiber and stores it a couple of years in their barn before they send it here, a moth might move in and then the moth will start eating up all the wool. So I think this is going to be our last question. I think it's a great question. Gia from Mrs. Shell's class wants to know what other kinds of products can you make from wool? Is it just sweaters and mittens and hats? Oh, what a fabulous question. There's so many other things you can make with wool. Um, starting at your house, you can make wool carpeting. You can make the weather stripping around your doors and windows. Thinking about your car and airplanes, you can make the seats you sit on. You can make the insulation in the hood of your car to keep your motor from overheating. Um, and then in addition to those non-woven, felt products. There's so many more knitted things that are made um, every day and more and more as folks discover the benefits of wool, which keeps you warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And not to get gross, you guys, but wool doesn't smell. If you smell, um, your sweaters still don't get a smell. And they're also very easy to get clean. And of course, they're so very durable. They last for a for a very long time. Um, we'll show, show you some pictures maybe another day of what this wool felt looks like and how it has so many uses. Well, Mary Jean, we cannot thank you enough for inviting us into your business um, to show us how, uh, how you do the things you do every single day to take Emma's raw fleece and turn it into beautiful items. Thank you for being with us. Thank you classrooms from across the state for being with us. If you have additional questions, you can feel free to email those and, and we'll pass them along to Mary Jean and Emmeline. So thank you for being here. Bye everyone.